almost at Martin Luther King Day that's coming up on yes. Monday. And I was thinking about um, last year in Sunday school, the mm -hmm. kids and I played a game called MLK or the Bible. And I would give them quotes yeah, and fine. they had to guess whether or not it was MLK or the Bible. And there was one that really, really stumped them. And I'm going to give it to you. Um, oh, you're going to get return it. to seminary. You're going to get it. You'll probably actually be able to tell me mm -hmm. not only which source it's from, but the more specific stuff. Yeah. But specifically, we talked about that justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Oh, that that's Bible. Bible, of course, that's Bible. It is the Bible. But he definitely quoted that. Yes, do you remember what speech he quoted that in? Would it be that uh, Washington speech or...? The, do you remember the name of the speech specifically? I have a dream. Yes, it is the it's I the, have the, a dream speech, which is what yeah. I have in my hands now. Yeah. And I was thinking about that passage in particular about justice and righteousness and the dreams that Martin had that he laid out in that speech. And I was just thinking about where we are in our world today. Uh, this speech was in 1963. We're in 2018. Uh, do you think that we are close to Martin's dream or far away? Or where do you think we are in terms of that? Oh. You know, I think that uh, there, there were definitely some positive steps made right at that time or shortly afterwards. But there are so many areas where we need to continue and progress further. Uh, just. Uh, Two days ago, we had here Poor's, Poor People's Campaign, mm -hmm. and that is also originally a movement associated, if I am not mistaken, with you're, Martin Luther King. You're correct. He worked with uh, the original iteration. This time around, it's uh, Liz Theo Harris and William Barber. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, that tells you, you, you know, that yes, uh, very often these days we need to go back to learn from our predecessors and take it further because there are there is clearly to my understanding unfinished uh, unfinished ministry unfinished work uh, and in this area of racial justice we've seen so many really tragic uh, deaths of of predominantly young African-American men uh, and the, in, in the hands of police, for instance. And that tells me that there is clearly imbalance uh, how people are being treated. And that is, that is part of that phenomenon of uh, racial uh, segregation, mm -hmm. racial injustice in our society. But, you, you know, I'm, I'm coming from outside. <laughs> uh, I, I will play that card again. But uh, I think honestly, uh, I, I would be more interested how you see it. Because, uh, you, you know, you as an African-American woman uh, from, from United States, uh, you know, I'm a white guy coming from outside, uh, mm -hmm. from, from a country where there was hardly any African-American known to me personally until when I went to seminary and there were seminarians from Ethiopia and from Madagascar. Mm -hmm. uh, but before that was, you know, very, very difficult to, to, to even understand. Right. Now I'm becoming more encultured in, in understanding and, and seeing that injustice and being shocked by that. But how do you see it yourself? Yeah. Um, so it's, I find it just really interesting. It's not a great word, but I guess it's the best word I have in that um, as a child, I grew up um, hearing the I Have a Dream speech in school. We watched recordings of it. I 
grew up with a mother who was maybe 9, 10, 11 years old when this came out. Um, my grandfather was, a, was in the thick of these things. And so having grandparents and parents who lived through Jim Crow, who lived through the Civil Rights era, and hearing just not even stories of protest or activism, but just their day-to-day -day lives and the things they saw on TV and the ways that they were that they were treated. My mother was, I think, the third black teacher mm -hmm. at her school, mm -hmm. and none of them had worked with each other, so they just kept replacing each other. Hmm. And she ended up working at her school for over 30 years, but like just hearing something as simple as that in, and thinking about where I am today and all of the chances that I've had, all of the opportunities that I've been given, the life that I've lived, it's really difficult for me not to say that some parts of this dream have indeed come true. Yeah. Um, at the same time, a lot of it hasn't. And there are a lot of things that I think about when I look at things that happen in the news today, whenever I hear about a young black person, uh, it is predominantly men that get reported on, but it happens to women too. But whenever I hear about those stories, I remember my mother telling me about when she was really, really young and hearing about the lynching of Emmett Till, yeah. who was, what, 14 when he was, when he was murdered? Mm -hmm. And hearing, and just looking at the ways that our structures play out. Sure, we don't have Jim Crow in the same way that my grandfather did, but we do have a school to prison pipeline and a prison industrial complex that takes out generations of black people, particularly black men, and takes away their ability to get jobs, takes away their ability to vote, um, takes away their ability to be within their communities. It, destroys communities. Um, there are people who are harassed for no reason and get taken in for low-level offenses or nothing at all. And then with this past presidential election, and you were saying about um, the increase of vocalized racism, mm -hmm. um, it's really made clear to me that we have made progress, but a lot of the progress that we thought we made wasn't progress that was permanent so much as it was the people who felt this way didn't feel like they had the power or the ability to say how they felt and to act how they really wanted to act. And now it feels like we're regressing a bit into this super racist culture where it's okay to march with torches and it's okay to, to call people out of their name and to beat them because they're a black person on the street or because you think they're a black person on the street because there are people who sort of get caught up even though like race is more complicated. And I feel like for a lot of my life I was able to see a slow trajectory going forward. Mm -hmm. And right now, I think the activism is still there. I think the work is still there. But I think the demons that existed in the 50s and the 60s and that my grandparents and parents had to deal with are coming out again in a way that my generation and the generation below mine haven't seen before. Yeah. And that's really scary. Yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking uh, because, yes, I, I did not have that exposition, say, to... Uh, african-american culture or anything growing up but in the seminary for instance that was an, a compulsory part of studying uh, about the movement mm -hmm. uh, and to study and read uh, martin luther king uh, sermons and writings and and learn more about that and that is perhaps can bring us some inspiration also uh, I I watched some documentaries on television and, and elsewhere uh, here in America, but there is clear difference from what I heard in seminary or what I studied under communism, mm -hmm. believe it or not, um, 
and what I see being documented here in official documentaries. And that is, uh, maybe it is a bias of studying it at seminary, but clearly much larger emphasis or stronger emphasis being given uh, to uh, matters of faith mm -hmm. and, and religion. And that is not that often highlighted, how important churches and how important sermons were yeah. in, uh, in, in that movement uh, of Martin Luther King. And, yeah. uh, it is not a coincidence that one of the most prominent leaders was a man of faith. Mm -hmm. um, back then, a lot of the places where they could meet were churches. Yeah. And particularly, like the black church is a place of respect. Mm -hmm. um, not just respect for, for God and respect for God's people, but specifically a place where someone who was a maid or a handyman, someone who was mistreated or spat upon or called boy or worse things, uh, for being a black person could come and they had status mm -hmm. and they had presence and they were reminded that they were a child of God and that they were not forgotten and that God stands on the side of the oppressed and that God is with us in our movement. Mm -hmm. And hearing that message from folks like Martin Luther King and other leaders was uplifting and motivating. Inspiration and encouragement coming through the pages of the Bible. Exactly. That's exactly, and, and theology in general, because uh, back in Prague, I, I, I knew that he went to study uh, theology uh, in Rochester, mm -hmm. uh, in, the, uh, in the seminary where a famous um, social uh, gospel uh, professor, uh, Walter Rauschenbusch yes. uh, was uh, originally, they, they never met because he died much earlier, uh, but uh, that, that was clearly an inspiration, I, I think also, and uh, or that if not theological, then spiritual uh, inspiration coming from Mahatma Gandhi Mm -hmm. in, in that uh, non-violent resistance yeah. uh, was even inspiration for, for me and our generation in our political struggles. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was partly why we studied that. Yeah. And, and, um, so, but that could become inspiration even today, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, people are, it's, it's interesting to, to see the American media perspective of Martin Luther King when they would uh, generally lift up those nationalistic tones, you know, mm -hmm. or aspirations of America and, and other things, which is good to call upon those uh, good angels in our past and in the, our history here in America. But they are either sliding by or neglecting or not knowing what to do with that are exactly these kind of passages, uh, quotations from prophets, quotations yeah. from gospels. And, 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 and seeing how, how integral and important part it was. And I, I think that it can still be I agree. Uh, these days. Do you know who introduced Martin Luther King to uh, Gandhi's practices of nonviolence? No. Um, it was a Quaker man, black man. Oh, well, Do you know his name? No, 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 uh, no. Now I, I, I remember that I heard that it came through Quakers. Yes, uh, but it came specifically through a man named Bayard Rustin. Mm -hmm. who actually planned the March on Washington, um, but because he was at that time, he, well, he's uh, passed away now, but he was a black man who was an out gay man. Mm -hmm. And there were folks within the movement who did not want to have him in the forefront because they thought it would be damaging. And they made some threats, and so he... He did a lot. He helped plan the, the march. He introduced Martin to these concepts and doesn't necessarily get a lot of credit. Most people don't know who he is. As you said, you are not from America originally. And also, I am black and you are white. Mm -hmm. um, but we have worked together and we have done things around racial justice in New York and all that. 
do you have any advice to other white allies based on your experiences on how to support people of color and I, I, work I, towards I, the dream? For, for, for me, I, I think it is first uh, opening eyes and minds to realities. I think that there is still so much denialism Mm -hmm. you know, denying uh, what is the reality of, of our world. And occasionally it comes to me as well, you, you know, not realizing how un not normal it is that, for instance, most of those people in the subway uh, who are clearly homeless are African-American. Mm -hmm. You know, that's disproportionate that uh, the, those people in prisons are disproportionately, again, coming from minorities, yeah. predominantly African-American, but other minorities as well. And, and simply first step is really to open our minds, not taking something which is not normal as normal simply mm -hmm. because we were born in it or something like that. One thing for me coming from abroad was uh, my first uh, larger exposure to American uh, society was that I came to work for a year as a mission partner in residence in Louisville, Kentucky. And that shock when I came to the town and saw that it was really divided. Mm -hmm. There was one street and one, on one side, is, it was African-American uh, town, and on the other side, it was Anglo-Saxon town. And it was just absolutely shocking for me. Yeah, and that's uh, really common everywhere, not even just in the South, but in the North as well. Uh, yeah, sure. And, Which and I, people get surprised when they think about it, because, like you're saying, um, it's important for people to open their eyes and recognize, A, what reality is, and B, to question why that's reality. But if you look at cities in the North, like uh, Boston or Pittsburgh mm -hmm. or even New York to a certain extent, okay. um, they constantly make lists of like the top 10 most segregated cities. And you can look neighborhood by neighborhood yeah. and see where people are. So not taking this as granted. Yeah. You, you know, just realizing how not normal that is or maybe humanely normal, but not from the perspective of faith, say. No. You, you know, so, or th th that's another thing that Rutgers Church is somehow trying to be outside of that, but how segregated is our Sundays mm. in American culture? You, you know, we talked about those African uh, American churches, mm -hmm. you know, which help to put, uh, that liberation uh, in action, but uh, you know it is even a disgrace that there are African American churches. There should be churches full stop. There should be <laughs> churches full stop. I've, I would like I, I, to I, clarify that too. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. It, yeah, like there's a very long tradition of the African American church and the power of the African American church, yeah. but also like. Like I think you're saying, um, the reason that a lot of those churches exist is because we couldn't exist in mm. the white churches. We weren't allowed to have power. We were allowed to have a say. And I know that there was a period which just drives me absolutely crazy, you know, uh, that we are not going to baptize slaves because it would put them on the par with us. Yep. <laughs> And, and we would need to liberate them. Or there was a period where there was this long discussion and substantial discussion. In the end, it led into creation of African-American churches uh, because people were really driven out mm -hmm. or they were at the only place where they could be free were actually their own churches, like we talked yeah. about it. But I think that from the perspective of theology or from the perspective of God, this is where one can understand it humanely, politically, culturally, and everything. And it gave us marvelous spiritual, so everything. But on the other hand, what would be, I, I just dream, what would be the reality when churches would not or did not go that way? Yeah and churches will be completely integrated. 
you know, we are trying to do that. It's it's difficult because of the, those different cultures. Also, yeah. I, I'm not an African American preacher, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you've hit on some good things about needing to recognize reality and re recognizing what's wrong with reality, and I would also add recognizing the histories of why yeah. we're there. And I think I think those are places to start. Yeah. Um, but then just constantly educating, constantly working, constantly listening on part of allies, I think is going to be helpful to get us closer to a point where we can have churches that have different cultures, more churches that have different cultures, and celebrate those different cultures and lift them up and they learn from each other and we get closer to mm -hmm. what you were saying and what Martin was saying. And I, I, I think that the, it, it should be creative, it should be positive, it should be driven by rejoicing. Yes. You know, rejoicing in diversity, rejoicing in uh, discovering new perspectives and, and absorbing it and, and at the same time sharing. Mm -hmm. If there is a real depth of faith, then that is really what matters. And that leads into the struggle for justice for everyone. Yes. Uh, regardless of race, regardless of orientation, say, regardless of any human distinctions. Mm. Yeah. And may we continue to work to not only achieve Martin's dream, but to mm -hmm. come closer to living to that beautiful picture of the kingdom of God. Yeah. Amen to that. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.